so much better at living with my shit and we don't forget anything we just lose the ability to access it in our brains welcome to fables of our deconstruction a podcast where we took take a look at faith and other social structures and look at them critically I'm going to be honest with you, I'm doing this entirely remotely from my phone, and I don't have the script in front of me, so we're going to go a little bit off the cuff. Uh, I don't have the phone number for call-ins in front of me either, uh, but that'll always be in the show notes. If you want to call in and share your stories of deconstructing your faith or any other social systems, just uh, check the show notes and give me a shout. That being said... Wow, does it feel like we are being held hostage by an ever-shrinking minority? That's a quote from Jess uh, Blumke Greif from the Friendly Atheist podcast. The moment I heard her say that, I felt incredibly empowered to quote her because we're living in a world now where Roe vs. Wade has been overturned. And yes, every outlet, everywhere you're going to go, whether it's on the internet or in the world today, is going to be talking about it. And I think it's important that we talk about it here, too, because we have to be able to recognize what's going on in our world and be active about it. And I find that to be a very interesting concept right now, especially where I am, because I'm in rural Nebraska on an artist residency, and everyone here is tremendously friendly and giving people have purchased me drinks people purchase me tickets to watch fireworks on the 4th of July even though I'm not feeling particularly patriotic and I I definitely had new feelings while that was happening people here are being great to me even though this might be a deeply religious and possibly a a place that really agrees with the (laughs) overturning uh, of Roe versus Wade that took place, as well as lots of the other issues that we're dealing with in our country right now. There's definitely this creeping normalcy of Christian nationalism uh, that's that's peaking its way into our livelihoods and our lifestyles. It's been a difficult subject to approach, uh, especially for me, seeing that the Supreme Court uh, making the decision in in the case with the football coach, I think it was called Kennedy. Is it? I think that's the name of the case. Um, being able to to basically lead prayer on the football field. There's a lot of conversations about what that means uh, for teachers and in the classroom, and I think that that's a big challenge. There's definitely points to be made saying would this have gone the same way if this was a Satanist. Uh, I, I know that people often sort of like Muslim, but like, let's go to the extreme. Um, Satanists tend to not actually believe in Satan himself, but it's a, it's a way to push back. Um, and I think that what, what if, what if a Satanist ran a, a prayer, even a silent prayer, but openly satanic <laughs> on a football field? Would we be looking at this with the same lens? And, and I'm still contemplating the concept of being free from something. I would rather be free from a government-sponsored religion than free to participate in a specifically Christian prayer. Because I don't identify as Christian anymore, and I know that there are numerous people on the spectrum of faith and lack thereof uh, that don't identify as Christian either, and I think we're we're sliding into this concept where we're backsliding into the 1700s when looking at certain remarks in the overturn of Roe versus Wade. Uh, they weren't really citing uh, 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 anything relevant to contemporary <laughs> to contemporary law. I feel so off base not having notes in front of me. Uh, this is really more my feelings than anything. But it's just so challenging, you know? I've seen so many people, specifically on my Facebook, say, like, I'm not left, I'm not right, and I'm out of this whole damn thing. I don't buy into politics. It all sucks. Well, I've done some introspection. I've understood that particular stance for a long time. The the concept of, like, fuck it, I'm out was 
sort of my concept beginning my adulthood like what does the government do for me what what do any of these politicians care about me i'm not going to participate in this whole mess i didn't want to vote i remember skipping certain elections i remember um being pretty staunch at like well i just don't vote and the thing is yes yes 100% politics especially governing in the united states is a game and that sucks it's horrible that it's a game i agree that that's terrible but the thing is it's a game that's being played and it's being played right now it's being played all the time and people's rights and livelihoods and personalities their choices of who they love who they live with and how they take care of themselves and their body, bodily autonomy are at stake in this game. So throwing your hands up and saying, oh well to hell with it, I'm not participating, makes it easier for those who wish to marginalize others, those who wish to strip rights from others, and those who wish to transform what's supposed to be a free and open country into one that is more and more resembling that of a theocracy. There are even extremists on the right, specifically, and, you know, that's just the, the way it is. Um, most of the uh, evangelicals are right-leaning, and there have been some saying, you know, we're, we're looking toward a Christian Taliban, and, and they think that's a good thing. This is Christian extremism, and uh, one of the best comparisons I've heard uh, while listening to Cognitive Dissonance was that the the big problem is that the extreme right and the evangelical voting bloc have been playing an incredibly long game. They had this wedge issue back in the Reagan era of of abortion rights and how to abolish them, and they didn't care that it took them several decades, 40-plus years, to strip it away. They just knew to focus on it, and they're getting there. And the frightening thing, the thing that keeps me up at night, is knowing that we are in a major election year. We're in a major midterm, where if things turn deep red in the House of Representatives, there is a possibility, I'm not saying a guarantee, but I will say a strong possibility that the federal government could instigate abortion bans nationwide so it doesn't matter if you're in a blue island in a red sea or in a blue state that allows particular things things could potentially go wrong and so saying hey i'm not red i'm not blue fuck it i'm out isn't necessarily helpful because we're in this game whether we like it or not and the best decision we can make the best decision anyone who wants to adhere to evidence-based information and wants to adhere to crafting laws in a country that is embracing of its people who view its people as an asset those people need to get out and vote and the yes yes typically speaking we look at who's actually attempting to pass laws that help people and it tends to be democrats and that there are definitely people who say, well, they're not extreme enough for me. But what needs to happen in order to augment the game is you have to play the game and learn to manipulate the rules the way you, the ways that you are allowed to. Uh, I think about, I have a good friend who's really great at breaking mechanics in a board game. Really great at abusing mechanics in a video game. He finds little wormholes, if you will, puts his finger in there and stretches it until he can until he could do whatever he wants, really. And I think that that's a, an interesting way to approach this because uh, the evangelical voting bloc that would like to strip away rights and has already said, uh, Clarence Thomas, the, the Supreme Court Justice, has already said that uh, court cases involving things like gay marriage are going to be reviewed next, or at least he'd like them to be. And if we want to prevent these things and potentially enshrine things like reproductive rights in national law, we need to be able to play the same game. We need to have a long game. We need to know what we want, and we need to know that it's going to take a long time to get there. And if things aren't progressive enough, then we have to support those who 
progress where we can and compromise on what we can't, but always be prepared to recognize that, yes, we do have multiple parties in this country, but only two of them have any significant control. So we need to push for candidates in the major parties that actually want to make legislation that aren't just tax breaks, legislation that might actually help somebody. And we need to push those people through by voting. We need to get out and vote for them. And you, it's just the way it's going to be. You're going to have to think about things um, from who's pushing actual legislation that drives progress and drives acknowledgement that change is what we are. And we need to adhere to ev- evidence. And right now, largely, that's the Democratic Party. Uh, yes, once again, there are other parties that might be doing good things or even greater things. But we need to strive for those changes inside the parties that have control. And if those looking for better and improved futures vote Democratic, and every time there's a primary, we push to get the more the more progressive one in there, then we can see things starting to change. There's a concept called the Overton window. It's basically the idea of what's acceptable concept and speech specifically in a political platform it moves where the middle is right uh or correct i should say it moves where the the middle is where the where the moderates are and right now being moderate is far more skewed to the right than it used to be if you do research on the overton window you can see that people with radical um radical stances can manipulate it and right now many people in the evangelical voting bloc as well as participants such as the previous tre- uh, president have pushed that Overton window really far to the right. I'm not trying to make any distinct comparisons, but these things do happen in countries that fail their democracy and give up to fascism. But voting still matters, and we still got to go do it. It's incredibly important that we vote for those who are in parties that have power and are more aligned towards our interests than not. And we can begin to manipulate that at the local level. Vote for city council. Vote for mayors. Vote for county assessor. You know, anything. And if they have a viewpoint that more aligns with what's beneficial to you and beneficial to your neighbor, then pick those particular candidates. We need to start pushing that over to the window back towards the middle, back towards a conversation where theocracy isn't on the table. Because unless we're free from religion, we won't be free to have whatever religion we want. And that's one of my worries and one of my fears. I am on the road constantly. One of the things on my mind this week is that the roads in Missouri, the rural highways, were definitely built by people who built roller coasters. <laughs> because, whoa, those hills. But along those roads, I get to see so many signs about God and about choosing life. And, uh, you know, Jesus is the, the one way ticket to not hell. And I realize that. No one's in the car with me. I'm by myself. But suddenly I feel so outsider. When before I would have seen a church and been like, this is, you know, just like everything else. And I'm, I'm in a place that embraces me. And now I'm worried that the more I come into my own and the more I describe and define and understand myself, the more likely I am to be at risk. I often feel like a fox in a hen house coming to towns like this. Everyone's lovely to me. But they have no idea that I don't believe what they believe. I can't imagine what it would be like to be doing the exact same thing. To be the same artist but be black. Or be the same artist but have an obvious disability instead of a hidden disability. These things are definitely illuminating to me. Or to be the same person I am but be openly gay and trying to do this in small towns. Like, we need to find a way to move forward with a more supportive and caring system. A system that views us as the most valuable thing there is. Because without people, there's no taxes. Without people, there's no army. Without people, there's nothing to govern. So, 
Don't forget, we have that power. And this is going to lead me into the thing I want to deconstruct today. So there was a sign. There was a sign on my way to Nebraska last week uh, that said, Real men love babies. Now, I've become more and more aware of fallacies over the last year, especially as I've been researching how to be a better critical thinker. And fallacies are a great way to point out flawed reasoning, uh, whether it's circular or otherwise. And the fallacy that comes into play is my current favorite, because it's so easy to spot and so dramatically overused. It's called the No True Scotsman Fallacy. In the No True Scotsman Fallacy, the claim is that, well, no true Scotsman fill in the blank. It might be no true Scotsman would drink herbal tea, right? But you don't get to determine who's a Scotsman and who's not. Specifically in the description, all you really need to be is from Scotland. Then you're a Scots person, <laughs> right? So the, the uh, no, true, no true Scotsman fallacy came into play with this sign saying real men love babies. They're, they've told you out of the gate what it means to be a man. Although there are different definitions of what it means to be a man. And our culture has already begun to say, well, perhaps this definition is more fluid and more freeing. Perhaps there's only so much masculinity at play. And I identify as a man. I have male reproductive organs. I have, you, you know, uh, stereotypical masculine urges. I'm attracted to women. Uh, but here's the thing. I don't necessarily like babies. I also don't necessarily feel strong. I don't necessarily like aggression or lean towards aggression. As a matter of fact, one of the things that coming up in the 90s, especially with sitcoms, that I also don't really agree with is I don't think I'm always right. Even though here I am, the guy at the podcast, telling you who to who not even who to vote for, just how to vote, right? But I don't feel all the things that I'm told are masculinity or what it means to be a man. And here I'm being told that loving babies, real men love babies, right? So the fallacy is that real men don't have to love babies. I don't hate kids. I work with kids all the time. I'm particularly not fond of babies for a few reasons. I don't really want to take care of something that stinks and poops all the time, cries all the time, needs to be fed all the time. As a matter of fact, I wasn't even fond of having a baby dog. I love the dog now, but go back a year, two years, and not so much. It was a tough go. Now, if a baby were to be a part of my life, I'm assuming I would do my best, but I might have a hard time and not actually enjoy the baby. I mean, I'd actually love the fact that the kid's a baby. I think you can love someone and know that you don't love what they are right now. <laughs> like, I'm also a person with limited use of my right hand. So I don't like holding babies. and that, that, That's one of my biggest things. I want to do things I'm comfortable and confident in doing and take risks at my own will, on my terms. I don't want someone to throw a baby in my hands. As a matter of fact, this morning I helped a, a, a guy carry a large whiteboard Way too large for me to carry. I could barely lift it. He even mentioned that I needed to do some lifting. But I never told him I had a disability. And I'm trying to do a lot of things with two hands that I can really only do with one hand. And it was uncomfortable, but I knew it needed to get done. I wouldn't have chosen that. I don't want to choose to hold a baby. As a matter of fact, lately I've just told people, I don't hold babies. But I think I am a man. Sure, I'm not macho. And I don't really look to be tougher than anybody. I'm not necessarily overzealous about my my concept of myself and I'm not a jealous person really I can envy people but I'm not all that jealous but I think I'm a man and so I'm not convinced real men love babies because this is the no true Scotsman fallacy they're telling me someone with an identity of a man what I must be to have that identity and I already know that it's wrong being able to point out these fallacies is really helpful in deconstructing things because I can more immediately disagree with that sign and shrug it off and move on. The problem for me is that that sign's still there. And that sign might actually hurt people. 
people with similar views to me who aren't as ready. Maybe they're not as ready to acknowledge a fallacy or just say, you know what, you're wrong. And it's out there. And it's just being a big, ridiculous, propagandistic piece of fallacy. Okay. So, that's my deconstruction for today. I want to do one more thing about voting. Hey, if you're a marginalized person and voting is hard for you, please look into your voting districts. This year is going to be a big one. It's going to take us a long, long time, probably decades, I'm sorry to say that, probably decades to rebuild what we've lost and build towards something even better. But we have to turn out this year or that time that it would take to build something better will be much longer much longer. So, if you need help getting to your polling place in Iowa, feel free to reach out to me. I'm in central Iowa. Typically, right now I'm in Nebraska, but typically I'm in central Iowa. I would be willing to help you out. If you're nervous about going out and voting for your best interest, please look into organizations like American Atheist. Even if you're a Muslim, um, a Unitarian, I don't care. Atheists tend to not judge you there there are toxic atheists who will judge you but typically that's not the goal the goal is to say we agree we want freedom from religion let's work together if you reach out to them they can hook you up with organizations in your neighborhood that would be happy to have someone pave the way to a polling place for you someone who would take all the eyes on them wearing a big like atheist voter t-shirt so you can go do your thing without having to feel like you're being singled out. Don't be afraid to be an active part of your community, and don't think there aren't people just like you right around the corner, because there are. So look out for those individuals, find your community, and we can turn this ship around. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and play a fun little segment with uh, some voices of those who can get pregnant, who've been impacted by Roe. My name is Christine Reiner. I'm an entrepreneur and artist in Sioux Falls. Um, to say that current events in the world aren't terrifying would be a lie for me. I recently had a miscarriage in February, um, and it was a pretty traumatic ordeal, not just losing the life of a child, but also needing medical help. That didn't really happen. Um, my story contains four weeks of nonstop bleeding and pain, followed by a bunch of uninterested doctors who just kept sending me back and forth to the ER room. Um, I would be sent to the ER saying that my condition was really, really urgent. I'd wait around for nine hours and then they would tell me that it wasn't urgent and they were going to release me. So then my next step was to make a appointment with an OBGYN. So I called the office and that took two weeks for them to get me in. In between that waiting period, I went to the ER for my second time where I was released without any help. When I finally did see the OB, um, I'm, I'm not joking here, they told me we were going to do it European style, which meant that my body was too sensitive for a DNC, which is a medical abortion. So the DNC would actually cause more harm getting out the, the leftover pieces of conception, which my body was trying to shed, hence why I could not stop bleeding. This OB told me to just continue doing what I was doing, keep bleeding, and if it got to be too bad, go to the emergency room. I was billed $6,000, and no doctor called to check in on me, nobody cared to follow up, nobody cared about anything. Our healthcare system leaves women feeling like nothing, like the pain that they have is non-existent, and like their issues don't matter. Since I've shared this story on social media, I've had several friends reach out to me about the same kind of experience, only their doctors were not as empathetic. 
One friend said a doctor questioned why she would even come back. He he was baffled by her pain and was like, if, if I told you to go home and bleed at home, why are you coming back into my office? Like, do you people realize how painful it is to miscarriage? I hope you don't. I really, I swear to God, emotionally and physically, I hope you never have to experience that. Thank you for listening to my story. This has been Fables of Our Deconstruction, a podcast where we tear apart faith and social structures to better understand them and better understand ourselves. Once again, I don't have the phone number in front of me, but if you'd like to call in with your stories of deconstruction, whether it's faith or something else, uh, please go ahead and do that. You can find that in the show notes, or you can drop me an audio file over on Anchor, because that's where I'm hosted right now, on Anchor FM. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your week. Let's do what we can. Let's build a better world. Never forget, we're in this together. What I'm doing at this moment that I'll be cringing at a year from now When I think about it